Hey. Hey. Hi. Calling Chris Anderson in London, and uh, sorry to interrupt the Arsenal football game. You had to bring that up. Yeah, well, I'm doing not so good right now. How are you in Chicago, right? <laughs> Fine, it's Rick Beyer in Chicago. Thanks for mentioning that. And uh, welcome everybody to History Happy Hour. At least we're not watching some football game, you know. Well, I'm not um, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're going to wait a moment or two to join us uh, as we get started. And please post something to let us know that you're here um, so that we can say, give a shout out and say hello. And we're here talking about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. And all our broadcasts are also archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. So um, what's Doug McCord's fact of the day for us here, Chris? He says, greetings from the only state east of the Mississippi that has a triple continental divide where rainfall... Okay. Wow, Doug, you are really digging down <laughs> deep there. Oh, but, yeah. but we appreciate it. We appreciate it. Okay. And uh, we got uh, quite a crowd. We got Jim quite Latin, around. Duncan, um, Ken, and Joe, and bunches of people. Chris, while people are joining us and adding on, I wanted to say today's a very important anniversary. Is it? It is. It's an important anniversary because on this day in December of 1773. Oh, this the, isn't going to be good, is it? The colonists in Lexington, uh, Massachusetts burned all their tea in a common bonfire. Selfish, uh, ungrateful, disobedient. Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Three Not days. yet they weren't. Three days before the uh, Boston Tea Party. And so that was actually from a reenactment uh, uh, in 2012. And yes, there I am on the left, huzzah, wearing my uh, preaching hat and, yes. uh, and and uh, preaching truth to power, baby. Uh. That's what it's all about. So we've got some folks gathered here for a show, which is not about the Boston Tea Party. It is going to be about the Battle of Okinawa. So should we get started, Chris? What I did would you love say to. to that? You said, please. yes, please, Rick, please. Oh, please, please, please. Yeah, let, here it goes. Is open. The bar is open. Our topic today is the Battle of Okinawa, which has been called the last major battle of World War II. And our guest uh, coming to us also from the UK is Saul David. He is a professor of military history at the University of Buckingham. Is it Buckingham? Buckingham? How does one say it? Buckingham is All right. good. Buckingham, Buckingham, Buckingham will do, too. Okay. <laughs> he'll, cut, he'll cut you some slack, Rick. And a prolific <laughs> history author. I can't even count how many books he's written. So we'll just focus on the most recent one, which is Crucible of Hell, The Heroism and Tragedy of Okinawa, 1945. Welcome to History Happy Hour, Saul David. Professor Saul David, what are you drinking? I'm drinking a glass of red wine. Um, it's partly because of the time, Rick. We're, we're, we're about nine o'clock um, in UK time. I've just had dinner and we had a very nice uh, roast beef. Uh, and with it, I had a little bit of red wine, but not too much, of course, because I knew I'd be chatting to you guys. Excellent. And Chris, what have you got going there today? Well, I, well, I have a pint of cider and I knew I would be chatting to you, Rick, so I made sure it was a, a big, tall pint. All right. Well, I'm just drinking a beer as usual. So, uh, you know, it's all all good stuff there. Um, so I want to start off uh, talking to you uh, by uh, quoting uh, uh, with a quote that's actually in your book uh, from Hanson Baldwin, famous military correspondent of The New York Times, also a military historian in his own right. Um, and I'm abridging this very slightly. Uh, he wrote, never before had there been and probably never again will there be such a vicious, sprawling struggle. Never before, in so short a space, had the Navy lost so many ships. Never before, in land fighting, had so much American blood been shed in so short a time, in so small an area. There have been larger land battles, more protracted air campaigns, but Okinawa was the largest combined operation in a no-quarter struggle fought on, under, and over the sea and land. So starting out, uh, give us a sense of why this battle 
takes place, why it's so important, and why it was important for you to tackle it? Well, I think the first point to make, Rick, is uh, they didn't know what was going to happen next at the time. So the reason they fought the Battle of Okinawa is it's another stepping stone on the way to the Japanese home islands. What we realize, of course, and the, the quote you've just given sums it up so pithily, is that it was actually a really seminal moment in the Second World War. But no one who, who was involved in the planning of it and indeed in the fighting of it realized that. So uh, you, we always have to remember this as historians, that things unfold in re real time. And their decision to uh, choose the island of Okinawa was purely based on its geography. It was the culmination of this long, long strategy that had started in Guadalcanal, which is that sooner or later, uh, we're going to get close to the home islands. And Okinawa, being the most southerly Japanese prefecture, was the place that they were ultimately aiming for. I mean, it, they could have gone elsewhere. There was talk about going to Taiwan or Formosa, as it was at the time. They were even thinking of going to the Japanese, uh, sorry, to the Chinese mainland. But Okinawa, when you look at the Pacific Ocean, makes complete sense. It is 400 miles south of the most southerly Japanese home island, that is Kyushu. Uh, and it was a location, if they could take it, that would provide not only a, a floating, you know, a large floating aircraft carrier, but also a naval base for the final strike on Japan itself, which was scheduled, uh, it, it needs to be remembered, for later that year, that's late 1945 and early 1946. So just to stress the point, no one who fought or even planned the Battle of Okinawa realized that it was going to be the final battle of the war. I, I know that's an obvious point, but it, some, we sometimes need to remind ourselves of that. Yeah. So, so what, what, one of the things I'm curious about is obviously you're English. Uh, uh, Okinawa is an iconic American battle. Um, and so it must, it's unusual for Americans to hear a different accent talking about this battle. I guess an equivalent would be, you know, an American writing about the Battle of Waterloo. We can certainly do it, but it, it's different. What do you think that you brought to, well, first of all, what drew you to looking at this battle? And um, what do you think you bring to it, seeing it through English eyes or, or, or from a different perspective? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, it's probably a question my American publishers were wondering, actually, when they, <laughs> when they received the pitch from, from my agent and, and we first had that initial chat. I think from from my perspective, the interest for me as a military historian is I didn't know much about the Pacific War, you know, and I think I think you can stretch that to the whole of the British reading uh, uh, public, uh, certainly people interested in military history. We tend to concentrate far too much on, on what's happening in Europe. Uh, we, we see it as the be all and end all. It's, it was interesting looking at the two. Uh, anniversaries this year, both uh, VE Day, Victory in Europe, and VJ Day. And the one that got all the attention was VE Day. Now, uh, to the extent that people almost imagined that the war ended at VE Day. So one, I was definitely filling in a gap in, in, in British knowledge, but I also I was filling in a gap in my own knowledge. Uh, so that's, that's the reason I, I got interested in the first place. But uh, much more pertinent is what can I bring to the table? Because if I can't bring much, why bother doing it? And I, I I, I, a couple of quick points to make there. Um, military historians certainly shouldn't feel bound by, you know, a very tight a period or a tight area of study. I think the fascinating thing about war is that although technology changes and the sort of weapons you use change, the way you fight and the motivation and certainly why soldiers fight and, 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 and how they fight doesn't change that much. There is a, a universality to military history that entirely justifies, in my mind, a military historian covering quite a broad, broad span. And I've written about the Roman times and I've, uh, of course, written about modern times too, all the way up to the Entebbe raid, which of course is an anti-terrorist operation, but did involve uh, military special forces. So, uh, but what can I bring to the table apart from being a professional military historian is really seeing it from a completely objective, seeing it through clean eyes, I suppose. Right. Um, a lot of Americans will American historians, just the same way with me when I'm writing about British imperial history, will be carrying a lot of cultural baggage right. from their own preconceptions and their own uh, sort of sense of their uh, of their culture and how history is unfolded. And I think when you look at it with completely fresh eyes, like I did, uh, you may uh, bring in a slightly uh, different perspective. One, th I, you know, I'm not saying for a second that American historians have been insensitive to the uh, Japanese 
uh, uh, side of things in, in the slightest. I, w- I wouldn't suggest that for a minute. But certainly for me, because I'm not American, I, it was much easier for me probably to mm-hmm. look at it in the round from the Japanese, the Okinawa and the American perspective. Yeah. Well, I mean, I really notice it because you know, I don't think an American can actually write a history of any battle in the Pacific and not bring their own baggage to it. So that was kind of a nice, a nice change. Sorry, Rick. No, no, I uh, all good. So um, uh, I want to talk, uh, and I think Chris wants to talk too about uh, the commanders in this battle, and um, you know, get us a, a, a kind of both a sketch of them and, and sort of how they did. But but I want to start off by one just amazing fact that um, I don't know if it struck you, Saul, the way it struck me, that the American commander in this battle, his father was a Confederate <laughs> general in the Civil yeah. War. Says, says, Simon, my wife, I showed this to my wife and she said, what's his name? And I said, Simon Bolivar Buckner, both of them, because it's senior and junior. And that is an yeah. amazing fact all by itself, isn't it? Amazing um, detail, actually. And I, ha- I did a double take, actually. I thought, well, you know, presumably it's his grandfather, and I double checked it. And I think it goes without saying that a Civil War general to have uh, uh, to, whose son would be a second world war general he's got to have him pretty late and of course that indeed was the case um I, I, and he was a general Buckner, pretty young junior. and he was a general pretty young exactly so he it's interesting i mean the career of of, of buckner jr is is very impressive both in terms of of his achievements during the uh, civil war but also you know he had an interesting political career he was you know he was running um you know he was running for office well into the end of the 19th century and i think all of this matters actually uh, rick and chris because uh, what it added up to is an awful lot for the son to live up to you 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 find this with you often find this and it could be in a sporting family it could be in, mil- in the military it could be in politics but when you have a son of of a high achiever it puts added pressure on that son to prove himself, frankly. And one of the interesting things about uh, Bolivar Buckner Jr., that is the, the, the general, of course, who, who takes command of the U.S. 10th Army at Okinawa, is he has not been tested in battle prior to this operation. So you could quite legitimately ask the question, well, why is he given command? And I, I think... Um, a couple of things are, are, are in favor. Of Thanks him. for saving uh, us you know. the trouble of asking that, by the way, which I know Chris was literally poised to ask. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's bound Absolutely. to make the question, isn't it? So he has no, he has no field experience. Uh, he's a lieutenant general. So he has the rank to be given a field command. Um, and there was very much a sense, I think, in, on the one hand, of next man up, you know, who, who hasn't ha- had the opportunity yet. But I think it was more than that. Uh, I think what was going on in the in the Pacific at this time, which is well known to any students of the of the Pacific War, of course, is that there was a lot of uh, bad blood or competition between the Navy and the Army uh, and the Marines, of course, being part of the of the Navy. And there was very much a sense that this battle with a large number of U.S. troops involved needs to be commanded on the U.S. Uh, Army troops, sorry, involved needs to be commanded on the ground by a U.S. Army general. So. Probably the obvious man to take the job, certainly in terms of his experience, was Holland Smith. Uh, Holland Smith had commanded at Saipan the year before, but Holland Smith had made himself pretty unpopular with the U.S. Army Chief of Staff. He's a, fact, he's a know, Marine general. general. We should we should say. Yeah, yeah sorry, Smith's Rick. I, 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 sh- I should have made that point. He's a Marine general, mm-hmm. and uh, Holland Smith was very experienced and he was very good. I mean, he was very aggressive. Uh, and I think we'll no doubt we'll come on as we unfold the story of the battle to one of those crucial moments where things could have been different, could have gone differently. And I think Holland Smith probably would have taken the decision that uh, <laughs> that Buckner does not. But right. in any case, uh, Holland Smith has made himself very unpopular with the uh, U.S. Army by sacking one of their generals. So he sacks a divisional commander uh, uh, for reasons w- uh, for reasons which, and this is the really interesting bit. Buckner is actually put in charge of the of effectively the court of inquiry to decide whether or not this is justified. And he decides it was not, you know, so you can see that if you were army, you were you were you were very much going to be in the camp of supporting this general who, by the way, interesting enough, was also another Smith, Ralph Smith. Uh, And Ralph Smith was ultimately exonerated. But of course, that's too late for him. He's already been sacked and, you know, and 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 been taken out of his command during the Battle of Saipan. 
But in any case, the broader point here is that Holland Smith, this pretty much disqualified the possibility that Marine General would command on Okinawa. And they look for the next man up. And one thing Buckner did have in his favor is that, you know, for all his inexperience, he was tremendously good at getting on with people, uh, his subordinates, which, you know, is a skill all, all, all of its own, actually. Uh, you know, we shouldn't underestimate it. But of course, you need other skills as well. And he did very well in keeping, uh, you know, the, the Navy and the Marine subordinates uh, under him happy uh, for most of the campaign. And I'm sure we'll come on to the bits where, you know, they were less happy. I, I, and I'll just jump in before I give the next question to Chris, or I don't give it to him. It's it's his by right of <laughs> honor and descendancy. Yeah. Um, that um, that uh, for people who are interested, you know, to this case that Saul has made illusion of, if you simply Google Smith versus Smith, you know, Pacific, yeah. or Smith versus Smith Saipan, you can find a wealth of material, and it's an absolutely fascinating uh, descent into bureaucratic uh, military hell uh, uh, and, and worth taking a look at. Mr. Anderson, over to you. Well, no, I, I mean, one of the things that I find very interesting is, you know, when we talk about the ETO, we always talk about Eisenhower and there's some you know trouble with personalities. But on the whole, it's this great story about we're all going to work together. We're going to beat the bad guys. Um, but when you look at the Pacific War, it just seems to be no cooperation and most of the senior commanders are all American but there's still no cooperation <laughs> um, but when looking at the commanders on both sides and I would like to get a little bit into the Japanese side of this it seems like they pick commanders that totally disregard all their past experiences I mean you know by this point they've been at war for in the theater for about four years so they pick Buckner who's never commanded really uh, he doesn't take advantage of the lessons learned it's say Saipan, Guam, whatnot. Um, and then Ushijima, who is kind of an on again, off again. Yeah, I'm going to command. No, I'm not. Yes, we should do that. Uh, and I, it, I, it just struck me, and I'd kind of like to get your thoughts about, you would think by this point in the war, climactic battle, both sides would have been saying, we really got to get the A-team in here, guys. But it doesn't seem like there's a lot of A-team in the commands on either side. No, it's a it's a very good point. We we talked a bit about Buckner. I'll you know I'll happily talk a bit about Ushijima now. I mean, he was a man who had experience. He had a bit more field experience than Buckner, actually. Interestingly, right. but Chris, you 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 hint, you you you've latched onto something that's very relevant to the Japanese military, and that is that they did have a tradition of the senior man, the senior field commander, not actually making all the key decisions. He right. he was effectively operating as an umpire, and he led his subordinates, particularly his chief of staff and his senior um, uh, operations man make a lot of those decisions. And actually, you can see them in this picture here. So Ushijima in the picture we're looking at now is on the left as you look. Uh, and across from him in the center of the picture is his chief of staff. And then immediately, uh, I think I'm getting this right, immediately to his, his left, so to the right as we're looking at it, is his operations officer, y Yahara, who plays an absolutely key role in, in the whole unfolding of the battle. But what you've got is a man, Ushijima, who not only is not going to take personal control of all the key decisions in the battle, because that was actually part of Japanese military tradition, not not for all commanders, but for some of them. But you've also got someone who spent a lot of his of the last few years of the war, you know, as things are beginning to go badly wrong for the Japanese uh, it, back in Tokyo in charge of the war college there. So he hasn't actually had field command for the last two or three years, and he certainly hasn't had he hasn't had any experience of army field command, which may have played a little bit into his lack of confidence in making these kind of key decisions. You know, you very much get a sense of they're passing the buck a little bit here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if things go wrong, I don't want to be held responsible. Although, of course, you know, when we when we were realistic about the uh, the the unfolding of a battle for the Japanese at this stage, if, if the battle goes wrong, you, you, you know, as, as we are going to discover, uh, there is the ultimate responsibility that needs to be taken. Yeah, I mean, it, it strikes me because, you know, at Peleliu um, on Saipan, eventually, and then at Iwo, of course, the Japanese discover, well, if we're going to attrite the enemy, we'll let them land, and then they can fight us endlessly in the hills, and then we'll cause some serious casualties. But but yeah. then at Okinawa, there's that kind of, are we going to do this, are we going to do that, and they don't do either. Or they, yeah. But anyway, I, 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 no. I, I'm probably getting ahead of myself a bit. But so, 
Well, 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 yeah, but I but can I just say that that the irritation that Chris has is is mirrored in the a Japanese staff officer that you mentioned, <laughs> okay. uh, Hiromichi Ihara, who uh, who 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 says you know we we sh we we should wait for them to attack us and. Um, and and but the other staff officers are like we can only wait so long. Okay, now we must attack, even though it doesn't really make any sense to do it. And um and 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 Yahara is just an interesting figure all by himself because he's probably the only reason we know what the, is going on inside the Japanese command. So there yeah. you go. And it's a Address it's a that. unique it's a unique situation, frankly, to have an account of of a, of, of a campaign of this importance uh, and this late in the war unfolding in almost minute detail uh, from the Japanese side. You know, there are plenty of Japanese sources. Anyone who's worked in the Pacific War knows uh, from very senior people, uh, particularly back in Tokyo. You know, there, there was a well-known uh, sequence of debriefs that took place at the end of the Second World War. But we have very little in comparison for people actually uh, uh, in charge of operations in these various island battles. Uh, but Okinawa was unique because Yahara survived. Uh, and one of the reasons he survived is because his two seniors, Joe, the chief of staff, uh, 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 and the Ushijima, the, the commanding general, were determined that he would get back and report what had happened. And it, in some ways, actually, I think, you know, you very much see this in the way Yohara is talking about, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the way Yohara is talking about how the battle unfolds, they're actually quite proud of what they've done. They are surprised, uh, you know, in some ways at how well and how long they fought, how much they've strung the battle out, which which very much plays into, I think, the, the Japanese mindset at this stage of the war, which is we can't possibly win per se, but we can bloody the American nose or the Allied nose enough to bring them to the negotiating table. I think, you know, there's no question that was the, uh, the intention. Whatever they say, whatever grandiose statements they put out, that was the intention. And it probably had been since the Battle of the Philippine Sea um, the previous year, during the, uh, you know, which took place during Saipan. My turn? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, so I think, you know, since we're talking around topics, so I'll just uh, really briefly, um, you know, we want to take the island. Um, so we have a base for the invasion of Japan, which we expect to have happen. And we'd like to seize the airfields. Uh, the Japanese a, obviously would like to prevent that, but they want to cause lots and lots of casualties. So kind of really briefly, how does the, um, how does the invasion go and why does it get so nasty so quickly? Just so people have some background. Well, well, it's you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's interesting that the that, that you've already you both already alluded to the battle that was going on, even within uh, Ushijima's staff as to how they're going to fight the battle. And one thing I should stress is that there, there is a general strategy that's been laid out by Tokyo, but they pretty much let them fight the, the battle on the ground themselves. Uh, so Ushijima and his staff have a decision to make, which is what sort of battle do we want to fight? And you've already alluded to the fact that Yahara wants to fight a battle of attrition because he's seen that it's been quite effective on Saipan and Peleliu in particular. Um, Chief of Staff Cho, who is, of course, Yahara's superior because he's a a major general and 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 Yahara is a colonel. Uh, Cho is is very aggressive. He's been a kind of uh, you know he, he he he's I suppose he's known as one of the forward policy of the 1930s. You know he is a general who believes you and to be fair the way the Japanese were taught in their military academies that you basically take the offense whenever you can. It's not in their nature to defy de defensively, or it certainly wasn't in their training. Uh, so there's a battle between these two, which is ultimately won by Yahara, but it's never entirely won, which is why, Chris, I think you're saying that, you know, they're, they're caught betwixt and between. Yes, they plan ultimately to defend this incredibly formidable defensive position in the center of the island. But it's only right at the last minute that they withdraw enough troops there to, you know, to enable them to do that. Meanwhile, they've got a few troops in the north of the island, but most of them are based in this in this central belt that are a series of ridge lines, which... Uh, you know, OK, they make the final decision to fight there only at the last minute, but actually they've been preparing that position since the last since the previous August. So, you know, for for a good eight months, they have been digging into uh, these coral ridges and constructing an incredibly formidable defensive system, which fires both directions. So you take a ridge line and, and you move on to the next ridge line, you know, in a normal military environment. 
once you've taken one ridge line where you're you're safe from being shot in the back and not on okinawa and not on Peleliu or some of the other places you mentioned because they've dug into these defensive positions and they can fire in both directions and they will not leave those defensive positions until they've literally been winkled out of them they they've been literally burnt or shot or you know which is why from the american side it was known as corkscrew and burn that was the te technique they used to to winkle them out of these positions you know pretty grim stuff really i mean you had to you know it got to a point i'm sure we'll get onto this i'm jumping ahead a bit again a little bit but how do you get someone out of a position where they're in caves and tunnels, 60 miles of tunnels uh, in these defensive positions? You, you know, it's, you, you, you throw explosives down there, you pour petrol down there. I mean, you know, any, anything they could do to, to try and wipe out these positions so they could move on to the next one. And incredibly quickly, it becomes this slow, uh, brutal war of attrition that, yes, there are previous examples of in Iwo and Peleliu. But this was, you know, um, this was it at its apogee, mainly because of the sheer number of Japanese troops there were on the island. We're talking about 110,000 defenders, men under arms, probably about 90,000. No one knows for sure, but probably about 90,000 Japanese troops and another 20,000 Okinawan uh, uh, militia manning these these defensive positions. Uh, and therefore, unless you were going to use your imagination, and this is where Buckner's experience comes into play. Um, it was going to be a long, slow, brutal campaign. So uh, we have uh, been looking through some of the comments from our audience, and we have one person whose uncle was killed uh, at Okinawa, uh, another audience member whose father was wounded on the beach in Okinawa, and uh, obviously the wow. experience of American soldiers and 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 others there on the island. Everyone's experience is unique and different, but but. You know, in the book, you kind of go through a, a series of, of very challenging um, battles. But what is it? What is it like? How do you? Is there a way, either describing broadly or picking one incident, that you can give a sense of what it's really like to be there? I think you can. Uh, all I can do as a historian, two things actually. First of all, go to the island and 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 see what it's like see see what the ground's like see what the terrain is like see what uh, and again you can only get vaguely close to what it must have really been like but at least you get a sense of of the environment in which those soldiers fought but what i of course always try to do is let the soldiers speak for themselves and that in requires digging up enough first-hand accounts from people who were actually there and letting them tell the reader uh, what it was really like but if i was to you know to answer your question specifically to, to pick one single battle or sequence of battles. And by the way, this is not to belittle what people went through anywhere else on the island, because frankly, it was uniformly awful uh, for U uh, US Army troops as well as uh, US Marines. But the battle probably in my mind that, that really it got so utterly gruesome was Sugarloaf Hill. Um, Sugarloaf Hill, we've got the picture here, um, you know, it. It's interesting because that picture is taken from not that far away and it looks like a reasonable height, doesn't it? But it's, it's not very high at all. That is 100 feet high and 300 yards long. Uh, so nothing, frankly. It's a, it's a pinprick. It's not a mountain. It's not even, it's not even a foothill. Uh, and yet uh, a whole brigade uh, or, or a regiment, of course, in the U.S. Uh, Marine terms was sent in against that, uh, that, that uh, feature and something like 2,800 casualties were taken in, in taking it. So there's, those are the best mm. statistics, but it's the conditions in which the soldiers were fighting. Now, this picture was taken, you know, m maybe just before, maybe, well, presumably just after the battle, you can still see, you know, some of the, some of the detritus of war. But when the, when, when the battle was actually taking place, halfway through the battle for, for the fight for Sugarloaf and Sugarloaf Hill, and also two locations just behind it, which were in a kind of, three-part triangular defensive uh, position the rain started and those rains turned the battlefield into a quagmire so not only did you have the 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 uh, horrific conditions of fighting hand to hand for these defensive positions that as i've already explained you've got people inside though you know so chigolo pill we've just shown it there were people inside it as well as on top of it and when the americans got to the ridge and they first took it the u.s marines there was a counterattack to drive them off. And this went to and fro for two weeks, 2,800 casualties, a total quagmire by the end of it. You had, you know, without being 
unnecessarily graphic. Some of the descriptions of the battlefield at Sugarloaf Hill and the and the Horseshoe Hill and the other feature that they had to take are as grim as any I've read in any period of war during my 25 year career as a as a military historian. So it's as bad as that. And, you, you know, if you want me to go into a bit more detail, I will. You, you've got people sliding down a hillside. I think there's a famous description by Eugene Sledge, who uh, doesn't actually fight at Sugarloaf Hill, but he fights for one of the other other two locations in which he says, I, I fell down the hillside and I literally fell into decomposing bodies of American Marines. And as we all know, guys, you know, you never leave a Marine in the field unless you absolutely had have to. And they had to at Sugarloaf Hill and, and in many of the battles on Okinawa. And those bodies were decomposing. And so Sledge had the, you know, the horror of sliding down the hill into the body parts and seeing maggots come out of the, you know, it's just just horrific. The smell, the sight, the conditions, the cold, the wetness. I mean, you know, just add up everything you can think of to make a battlefield appalling. And it was there present at Okinawa. And I've looked at a lot of battlefields, as I've already explained, and I've read a lot of first-hand accounts. And I've never come across anything that makes it seem as unutterably horrific as it must have been there. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, one of the things that struck me so is, is you know, you'd mentioned this in the book, um, the casualty six Mardiv suffers taking Sugarloaf Hill. But one of the things yeah. that strikes me is is um, it's something like fifteen hundred uh, combat fatigue cases or shell shock cases. And, and not only that, but then the, the Marine Corps Gazette, the official Marine Corps publication, says morale is a problem and and it's starting to wear on us so i guess you know you kind of answered this but this of even of all the horrific battles in the pacific okinawa seems to kind of take pride of place for lack of a better way to describe it as being kind of amongst the most intense and the most awful um yeah you know iwo is often thought by many people and actually if you look in the look at the the intensity of the fighting iwo you know in some ways if you look at some metrics was was worse in some ways but i i you know for lots of different reasons i i my my you know if i'm gonna have to choose the worst battle right. uh, certainly in the pacific during the second world war it has to be okinawa because it's not just about the the experience for the soldiers you know i'm sure we'll come on to this it was the experience of the civilians too yeah. on okinawa that's what ultimately made it doubly horrific um, but just to talk a little bit about uh, about combat fatigue, because I think it is an important point. Um, you talked about the 1500 casualties uh, that were suffered during the battle for Sugarloaf Hill and the features around it. Uh, and you can multiply that, of course, for the whole Battle of Okinawa, 25,000, give or take, uh, combat fatigue casualties. That is a third of total casualties for the whole uh, battle. And that is unprecedented. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I certainly haven't seen figures to compare with that for any other battle involving American troops in the Second World War. Uh, and that will give you a sense of, of the um, how difficult it was for well-trained, tough, uh, and in many cases experienced troops to be able to uh, put up with the, 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 the conditions and the attrition rate that was going on. Uh, for this, you know, for this battle, um, 25,000 men had to be led away from the front lines, not because they were they were injured, but because they were mentally not capable of going of keeping going. And one quick other point to make is I don't know if we're going to come back to combat fatigue. And it isn't it's always been fascinating to me from, you know, I've written about the First World War, where it was first really recognized as a major problem in warfare, although, of course, it's always existed, is um, w one of the things that they noticed among troops with combat fatigue on Okinawa is don't take them too far away from their unit. So you've got this push and pull. You've got the pull to the unit, which is the home, uh, usually a company, but it could be a, a, a battalion, of course, as well. Uh, but you've also got the push, which is we can't carry on in the front line. So they began to realize, yes, you can take them out of the front line and they do start to recover, but don't take them too far away from their unit because then they feel completely, you know, disconnected without any kind of family, you know, if you want to call that military family around them. And that seemed to matter. That seemed to make a difference. There's a, I do recall a, a, a passage from uh, the Stephen Ambrose's Band of Brothers uh, book where somebody was suffering uh, some signs of combat fatigue and Lieutenant Winters just brought him back to the company command post, essentially a hundred, maybe a hundred feet, 200 feet away from the front line. That was all, you know, for 24 hours, that that was enough to help 
uh, combat the combat fatigue. That's a that's a uh, probably a, a tough lesson for the military. I want to remind everybody that we are talking to uh, Saul David, who is the author of Crucible of Hell. The Heroism and Tragedy of Okinawa, 1945, and we, as always, welcome your questions. We can't always get to all of them, but we'd love to have them. We did have a question about um, uh, uh, civilians, uh, and I, 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 if I can still find it here, the person asked, uh, sort of interesting, was there a, an Okinawan organized resistance that the U.S. coordinated? But the thing is that, uh, Anne, thank you for that question. The thing is that Okinawa really is a Japanese prefecture, as you've mentioned. And yeah. uh, the, ja the in fact, many of the civilians who suffered horribly in this battle, I mean, something like 100,000 casualties of civilians, many of them were recruited by the Japanese. For example, schoolgirls recruited to be nurses. So give us a sense of the civilian experience there. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I think after the event, um, because of the experience and because of some of the lies that have been told the Okinawans, the, the, the post facto uh, uh, kind of, I don't know, retelling of the story has slightly, has slightly shifted a bit. But what I can see from firsthand accounts at the time is that uh, a lot of Okinawans were very proud of what the Japanese <laughs> had done at the earlier stage of the war. I'm not saying every single one of them, and, and there'd always been a sense that they'd been treated a little bit like second class citizens compared to, you know, full blooded, that is full, fully ethnic Japanese uh, citizens. But nevertheless, as you point out, they were a Japanese prefecture uh, and they were in many cases perfectly happy to uh, serve the empire and the emperor uh, by joining uh, both both boys um, from the ages of uh, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 would join these these uh, blood and iron cores, as they were known, but also the the uh, females, the young females. And one particular girl that I quote in the book, you know, says how proud she was at, you know, Japanese, uh, frankly, taking it to the Western powers in the early stages of the war. So it would be wrong of us to imagine for a second that that the, the Okinawans were downtrodden, you know, effectively colonized and were anti-Japanese. I, I don't think that would be a, be a fair retelling. There's certainly been some bad feeling towards the Japanese home islands and certainly the Japanese government since uh, the Second World War because of what unfolded and what and the way it unfolded, in particular, the lies that were told the Okinawan population about what the Americans would do if they got their hands on them. And this led to enormous amount of unnecessary bloodshed and suffering. Uh, and what they were effectively saying is uh, you will be raped and murdered by the Americans uh, and therefore it's better to die first, either by killing yourself or by you know trying to take an American with you before you die, and this, by the way, was a mindset that was also uh, you know gaining or didn't need to gain. It was it was felt very much by ordinary civilians on in Japan proper. And of course, there's a lot of um, you know there's a lot of brainwashing going on to create this sort of state of mind. But that's how a lot of people felt. Um, so it was only after the war, with the experience, well, it was during the campaign of Okinawa, actually, to be frank, where the the scales began to fall from a lot of Okinawan eyes because they were taken in by the American soldiers and looked after, put into camps, given shelter and given food. Um, you know, there were many instances, of course, where uh, Okinawans were killed in friendly fire incidents, but rarely deliberately by American soldiers. You know, I've, I've seen atrocities committed by uh, allied soldiers, British soldiers all over the world. It happens. But generally speaking, uh, they do not uh, deliberately kill uh, civilians and that was certainly the case on Okinawa they behaved pretty well I think towards the Okinawan civilians uh, and it's it was appreciated then and it's still appreciated today whatever other issues there have been between Okinawan civilians and American servicemen and we I'm sure we are all well aware that this is a sort of ongoing issue right up until the current day but there's still a feeling among Okinawans who were uh, alive at that time that the Americans did the right thing and they appreciate uh, that so so one of the um Think one of the difficulties I have when I'm kind of planning my trips to the Pacific and I'm researching it is the, the Japanese are off, are very often just those people on the other side of the hill. They're the, the targets or the enemy, but they, you don't know that much about them. And, and one of the great strengths of your book I found is you have so many Japanese accounts. So uh, kind of curious how you went about finding them, if you were surprised by the number that you did find, um, and then kind of to take it one step further are there like 
stacks of Japanese accounts that Westerners have just ignored. You go into a Japanese Barnes and Noble, and there's a, you know, I was a soldier of the emperor <laughs> section of the bookstore. Or what's happened to those stories? Where are they? Yeah, yeah I, I I was surprised at how many I'd, I'd found actually. I, you know, as, as a historian, you are searching a new subject. You're always pretty optimistic. You think you'll 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 find a lot of good material. But I'd been warned actually. Uh, by someone who's worked in this field, not not on the Pacific War specifically, but the British war against the the Japanese in a naval sense. And he said, well, you know, there are these classifications of documents that I referred to earlier that are reasonably well known. They, the debriefing that took place with the senior civilians and military. And we get a very good idea if we can believe everything we read in those accounts that of, of what of what they were thinking and why they took the decisions they were taking. But you don't get so many many accounts of what is happening on the ground as far as the uh, the ordinary soldiers are concerned. And of course, civilians are another matter entirely. So I would say actually that the biggest coup in the book from my perspective was going to Okinawa itself and finding a real treasure trove of first-hand accounts by Okinawan civilians, which uh, by the way, had very helpfully been translated into English. Uh, so I didn't have to do that. That were just waiting there in the various uh, so-called peace museums. Um, you know, I'm sure you both know that the Japanese since the end of the Second World War, you know, they don't have war museums, they have peace museums, you know, for obvious reasons. But in in a number of peace museums in Okinawa, there are, you know, some harrowing accounts by civilians. I only use, use the fraction of them to be to be truthful, Chris. So, you know, for any other historian who wants to flesh this out a little bit more, there's, there's a lot of material. I mean, I've got a lot of it, but you you've got you, of course, got to make a judgment as, as a writer as to what how much you're going to use. And I wouldn't say I shied away from putting in more grim detail, but it but it was by that stage of the book, particularly towards the end when they're when they're moving back towards the final redoubt at the south of the island, which is where most of the civilian casualties are incurred. And therefore, most of the real drama for the Okinawan civilians uh, really begins. Uh, that's where their story begins in 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 any detail. You know, I, I personally myself as a writer was, you know, was kind of pretty much bowled bowled over or, or at least weighed down by the the amount of horrific detail i'd already had to not just read but lay out in the book and probably i you know i i, I didn't want to uh, go overboard about it i could have done you know it could have been another chapter or two frankly um but but i try to give an example of what was happening to to okinawan civilians and i was able to do that from these these wonderful uh, first-hand accounts that are on the island but but to be brutally frank with you, if you if you want uh, uh, hidden first hand accounts of what Japanese soldiers w w experience, there aren't many of them around. You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, all of us are looking long and hard for them. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a very simple reason for that, which both of you are well aware of. And that that is not many of them survived. Right. And even though 7000 prisoners of war were taken at the end of the Battle of Okinawa, which is, you know, completely unprecedented in one of these island battles. Um, very few of them were actually Japanese soldiers, that is Japanese mm -hmm. military. They they tended to be Okinawan um, uh, militia uh, rather than Japanese soldiers. So, or, or Okinawan so in the service of the Japanese in the in the Japanese military. So you get very few first-hand accounts from people who fought uh, in the Japanese armed forces because so few of them survived. We have a, a bunch of questions from people, and uh, we'll try to get to a few of them here. Uh, and uh, this is a, a long one, but probably worthwhile. Daniel Levitt says, I've read some depictions of Okinawa uh, that written with a rather unflattering depiction of army soldiers on the island, the U.S. Army, I assume he means. Is the army soldier's performance yeah. really that poor? Was it a leadership problem? Or was what I read just over-sensationalized fiction? Um, it's inaccurate to say the army performed poorly. There were instances of the army, uh, of certain army troops not, you know, not measuring up quite as well as they might have done. And interestingly, so I'll deal with that first, actually, just to get that out of the way. Um, very interestingly, Ralph Smith, who we talked about earlier, was the uh, commanding general of the 27th Division, 27th Infantry Division, which uh, Holland Smith, as I've already pointed out, was not impressed with their performance on, on Saipan. The one division that performed slightly underperformed during Okinawa was the same 27th Infantry Division. And I apologize if anyone's watching that who has relatives in this division. And of course, you know, you're talking about a division wide performance and really you're talking about how they did in really close quarter, brutal fighting that anyone would have struggled to, you know, to do well in. But leaving the 27th Infantry Division aside, 
Uh, and they were pulled out of the line and really sent to the north of the island, really for policing duties halfway through the battle. Uh, but I would say that the 27th Infantry Division aside, the army performed as well, if not better, than the Marine troops. Now, I, I'm currently writing a book about Marine Marines. In the You're Pacific a very case, brave so man. No, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Very foolish, I'm sure. I, I, so the reason I mention that, though, is to, is to stress the fact that, I, you know, I, 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 I have no reason to belittle the performance of the Marines. I'm hugely impressed with, with what they've done in many of the battles of the Pacific. Uh, but it is only right to stress that the performance of, of, of the Marines on Okinawa was no more, uh, you know, effective uh, than the army troops. It's, it's very difficult to compare light for light. It depends which position you were fighting and who you were up against. But frankly, particularly towards the end of the battle, the, the, the soldiers who were making the breakthroughs and were actually advancing the furthest uh, were the army soldiers now you know the counter argument would be well they had the you know they had the easiest uh, defenses to break through that may be part of the reason but it w what i won't accept is this argument that the army performed performed poorly on okinawa it simply isn't true uh, and interestingly buckner himself and of course he was an army general so you you might suggest he would say this but he he actually holds back the Marines, uh, just prior towards the final fighting, he dies in the last few days of the of the campaign, mm -hmm. to let the army have their head because, in his view, they deserve it. They've done well in the previous days and the Marines haven't been advancing quite as well as he would have hoped. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, whether you say one performed better than the other is, you know, that's that's you know, that's nuance. But what you cannot say is the army performed badly. You You, you can look at Buckner's performance as an army general, that's a different matter. But the individual army soldiers, no. So, Rick, I, I was going to, um, why don't we pop up James's question there? Because it's kind of in line with what I was I have to find asking. It. Oh, see if which, I can do that. Which uh, one is it? Here we go. See if I can get this right. There we oh, go. James. Uh, James Lighton says, can you comment on how winning the battle enabled the war to unfold differently? What would have been the likely consequence if we had not taken Okinawa? Well, it's a bridge. You know, I've, I've been giving talks about the battle since the uh, the book came out last March, albeit mainly on on screen like this virtually, uh, and no one has asked me that question. That is that is a brilliant question. The reason is brilliant is because although I can absolutely oh, you know, Jim Latin, strategy, I'm, I'm sorry, you've just Jim Latin is he never, doesn't need he doesn't need he's <laughs> never, his head is never going to get through a door again now at this point. <laughs> Well, the reason it's such a good question is because people, you know, I, I always ask, well, was Okinawa a battle worth uh, fighting? You know, did it make sense from a strategic sense? Which, of course, is the big question about Iwo and, and Peleliu. And, you know, you could mention a number of the other islands. And the answer to that question, in my view, is it made complete sense at that time. But, of course, what, what actually happened later changes everything. So uh, would the war have ended without them taking uh, uh, Okinawa? That is, without the blood lost on Okinawa. Yes, probably, because they would, and I'm sure we'll come to this, you know, in, in a second, because uh, they would have used uh, atomic weapons anyway. But go back to my previous point and never forget the point that nobody knows how things are going to unfold. So when the Battle of Okinawa begins on the 1st of April, 1945, uh, Roosevelt's still president. Yes, the, the uh, you know, the atomic weapons uh, program, Manhattan program has been, been underway for many years, but nobody knows exactly how it's going to turn out. They still don't know whether they will have a usable weapon against the Japanese. So, yes, they had to fight for uh, the island because the, the logical next step is to then launch an invasion of, of uh, Japan proper. But the really key date, uh, if we're going to go into the nitty gritty of this, is the 18th of June. On the 18th of June, uh, by coincidence, by the way, that's the day Buckner dies on, on the island of Okinawa. He's got a little bit too close to the front line and he's hit by a by a, a, an anti-tank shell, we think, probably, but anyway, he's hit by um, Japanese ordnance. Uh, and this picture is amazing, actually, because that's Buckner to the right as we're looking at the picture. Uh, he is next to a little uh, a clump of coral rock, as you can see in that picture. And within minutes of that picture being taken, I mean literally minutes, the shell comes in, hits that clump of rock, which is directly behind him, and bits of that rock and also uh, shrapnel from the shell presumably enter his chest and he's mortally wounded and just a quick uh, codicil to that picture because it's a remarkable picture you can see a helmet propped up on, uh, between him and the officer directly behind him who's the uh, 
uh, regimental commander of the 8th Regiment, the 8th Marines, actually, that are fighting that day. Uh, and that helmet, I'm pretty sure, is the helmet with the, with the three stars denoting his rank that he was urged to take off because the troops ahead of him could see the stars glinting in the sun. And that is probably the reason why the Japanese identified him and why they, they, they shot the, uh, the cannon at that particular position. But I'm getting off the beaten track a little bit here and I get getting back to answering the question, which is uh, the reason the, the, the battle may not have made a difference to the end of the war is because, uh, as we know, they were able to test the nuclear weapons. And that crucial meeting that took place on the same day as uh, Buckner died was in Washington. Uh, it was a meeting between uh, the president, who's now Truman, and his senior military and political advisors. And he's basically asking them, you know, how can we end the war? And they say, well, we're planning to invade. And the first invasion is going to go in in November. And then the, the following one, the spring of 1946. Huge numbers of soldiers are going to be involved and we'll take up to a million casualties. They don't specify that. They don't say that specifically during the meeting. They just say we're going to take a lot of casualties. And what's interesting about that meeting is that uh, Truman himself says we don't want it to lead to that is the invasion of Japan. We don't want it to lead to another Okinawa. Uh, in other words, he was conscious of not only civilian, uh, not only military casualties, particularly U.S. casualties, of course, inevitably and understandably. But he also realized that probably millions of Japanese civilians and soldiers won't, were going to die in that final battle. So the decision is taken, and it was probably the right decision because nobody knows what's going to happen next. Uh, and by dropping those two bombs, of course, the war is end prematurely and the invasion never has to take place. So if, if, you, if you go back from that, you say, well, why do, we need to, why do we need to invade Okinawa in the first place? Because they didn't know what was going to happen mm. next. As, as I said at the beginning, history unfolds as it does. And all you can do is make a decision with the information you have at that moment. Which is why history is so interesting. Because once you realize that it can go in any direction, it's not just a bunch of dead guys and what they did that's written in stone. It's this constant moment of contingency and we don't know where it's going to go. And, and that's why it's fascinating. Um, we're, we're running low on time, but I want to ask just, uh, and, and, and that question would have been a great closing question, but I do want to put one question behind it, which is we, we really haven't talked about it, so maybe you can talk about just a little bit the naval part of this battle. Because uh, yeah. as, as amazing and gruesome and, and compelling as the island part of the battle is, the United States Navy is there in great force, takes great casualties. That's a big part of what's going on at Okinawa as well. Yeah, a huge part. And I, you know, I try to give the Navy their due in the battle because it is that, you know, it is, some people have described it, you know, I, I'm sure you could quibble about this, the greatest amphibious uh, uh, battle, you know, that is air, land and sea battle of all time, you know, and people with D-Day may quibble about that, of course. And, and certainly the numbers of ships at D-Day were more, um, you know, over in over in Western Europe. But what you've got at Okinawa is a, an airborne, uh, sorry, a, 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 an amphibious invasion that is unprecedented in my view because of the distances it has to cover. Some of these ships have come all the way, have come 5,000. So that's the landing beach there. But some of these ships have come 5,000 miles all the way from the coast of the U.S. But they've come from all the other islands that they've taken from the Philippines and from the various other uh, locations to converge on Okinawa. And what that means is you've got 1,300 vessels, a huge number of those vessels, a large number of those vessels are warships. It's the greatest naval, it's the most powerful naval force that's, you know, I, I personally, I, you know, I, I've never seen a naval force to compare with it ever. Uh, you know, there are 20 aircraft carriers on the US side alone. The British have another four aircraft carriers. And those are just the, you know, the big ships. And then there are the battleships and then there are the, the destroyers. So you've got this enormous fleet, the, the, the fifth U.S. fleet fighting, a part of which, you know, I have to mention for my, uh, you know, the, the British viewers of, of this uh, of this of this broadcast going out. There was also the largest British Absolutely. naval fleet that congregated during the whole of the Second World War. That's really playing a bit part. So that gives you a sense of the scale of the naval challenge. So what actually happens? Well, what, what's fascinating about about the Japanese strategy? We've been talking really about what's been going on on the on the on the island itself. But the Tokyo's theory about how to defeat this this huge invasion force is to launch a massive kamikaze attack. Yeah, I think it's well known that the 
Okinawa is really the, the apogee of the kamikaze effort. 2,000 sorties sent against these sh uh, ships. And, and here's just one particular, um, uh, you know, th so this is a strike on one of the U.S. aircraft carriers. I think that was the 11th of May off the top of my head. It's the Bunker um, Hill, right? Guys, you, you, yeah, that's right. That's the Bunker Hill on the 11th of May. Um, interesting enough, in my in my gallery of photos, I've also got a picture of the guy who flew into it, who probably caused that explosion. It could have been one or two. And there he is. Um, uh, whose name slips my memory from for just a second but that, Ogawa. That, that that's him taken before yeah Ogawa and that's him taken before he takes off and the plan for the Japanese is to sink enough uh of the big ships the capital ships the battleships and the aircraft carriers to force the fleet to leave and if the fleet leaves the theory is you know no supplies for the guys on the on on, on the ground and sooner or later the Japanese garrison will be able to mop them up I mean it's hopelessly optimistic because of the sheer size of the US fleet. But one of the reasons it has even less success than it might have done, because they do, as I say, launch 2,000 separate sorties of single planes with 500 kilogram, 250 to 500 kilogram uh, bombs strapped to them. And they're intending to fly directly into these capital ships. And one of the reasons it doesn't work uh, is because of the number of ships, as I, as I say, but also because of the very clever picket system the Americans uh, construct and they, you know, they'd used previous uh, battles to perfect this system, the command and control system that they used since Philippine Sea. I mean, it was brilliant. So that as soon as you spotted incoming, you could send up CAPs, you know, the combat air patrols to intercept them. But you also had this picket of radar ships that actually, ultimately, and the reason they work so well is because they drew the kamikaze down upon them. In other words, the kamikaze attacked the first target effective they came to. And one of the reasons they did that is because by at this stage of the war, they had very few experienced kamikaze pilots left. That's so true. these were inexperienced guys, not brilliant flyers. And they, you know, we've got a job to do and we'll, we'll, we'll take out the closest ship. And they tended to be destroyers, which is why the U.S. destroyers suffered the most casualties during the battle. So, so, so I, I, can I, we have time for my last question, Mark? Go for it. All right. So first of all, I would like to know how, how do the Japanese remember this battle? And then following on from that, how should we, the Western allies, remember the battle? Well, um, Japanese first, because of uh, Yahara's accounts, they are able to get a, you know, a, a pretty detailed understanding of it. In other words, the information is there for them to learn about the battle. And in some senses, if they were allowed to, which they aren't really, which is to, you know, to to big up their martial uh, uh, past for obvious reasons, having lost the Second World War. It was all about peace. It was, you know, not about having an army that was aggressive. Therefore, you didn't tend to talk about even the latter stage battles of the war in which you'd fought, you know, pretty well. But they did fight this battle pretty well, given that pretty much everything was against them. Numbers, firepower. Uh, they had no supplies. They had pretty much no air cover during the whole of the battle. So uh, I suppose what I'm really trying to say is there's a disconnect between what they could remember and what they do remember. And one of the reasons why I was you know, very pleased to hear the news that my book was going to be published in Japan is, is because it would have meant that the, this sort of story told from all sides and told in as sensitive a way as I could, I could manage would be known to a Japanese public. I think it's important we understand our history, good, good bad, or, or indifferent. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, Saul, we, we have lost you. So... Um, you can try to come back and rejoin us. I uh, I think he is frozen solid there, Chris. All right. Well, um, you know we're come, try to come back in. We're gonna remove Saul here, and hopefully he's gonna dial. Oh, there he is. He's Sorry back. About that, guys. Hey. Uh, I'm back. Hey. I'm back. Uh, a brief. I know you lost me for a second. No, I was just saying about the the publication of of, of the book. Um, but sadly, uh, it, you know, I've just heard recently that there were one or two issues during translation and. It's not going ahead now, or at least it's not going ahead with the original publishers, which is a real shame. Uh, but going on to the American, the, the way the Americans uh, remember the battle, I think that, uh, you know, it, 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 it was a battle that, that cost tremendous bloodshed, extraordinary bravery. Uh, and it has been, you know, so it is remembered as an appalling battle, uh, as the last great battle of the, of, the, of the Second World War. It's a hugely significant battle, in my view, because... It really encouraged the American military and the American politicians to use nuclear weapons and therefore end the war. In other words, it had real consequences. But 
are the people who fought it given their due credit? I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I think it's, I think in some ways it, it's, it's, it's relevance probably has been lost a little bit by the dropping of the nuclear weapons. And that, that's a shame really, because when you look at the nitty gritty of the experience, you know, the nitty gritty is a, underplaying it as I, I hope I've explained already. When you look at the appalling experience servicemen who went through, but they did it. Uh, they were prepared to do it. They endured it. Uh, they survived and they came back to the States. And of course, no one was happier. I should just make this point when, when, you know, when people look at the dropping of nuclear weapons, they're horrified by it. But no one was happier uh, about the dropping of those nuclear weapons than the men who'd fought on, on sure. Okinawa and survived. Uh, why? Because they were slated to carry on fighting a Japan proper. Saul David, thank you so much for joining us today on History Happy Hour. And I want to remind everybody that his excellent book, uh, which we've just really touched the surface of, is Crucible of Hell, uh, available in all the places where good books are available. And Saul, thank you so much for being part of the show today. Thanks, Saul. Thanks, read, the, read the books, folks. It's, it's yeah, great. Excellent. Thank you. And I want to ask everybody to just hang on for a second because we have uh, some important news about our upcoming uh, experiences here on History Happy Hour. Uh, and I first want to mention that next week, just to mention briefly, we're going to have uh, author Kate Warren on talking about an American uprising in Second World War England. So this is a story that chances are you don't know anything about. Uh, it involves the U.S. military uh, and some unhappiness uh, in England uh, during the Second World War, and we're going to get into that. And then, as uh, we've mentioned before, we're going to take a week off, and when we come back, and we come back on January 3rd, the topic is going to be war movies. And we are going to invite you to be a part of this show because what we want you to do is to tell us what your favorite war movie is um, and so here's how it's going to work email us at have I got the address there right Chris? Yes you do yep. uh, amazing I am a typo king uh, HHH at stephenambrosetours.com email to tell us your favorite war movie does not have to be one of the five there that's just <laughs> illustrations and in fact one of those is my least favorite war movie ever I'll leave it to you to figure out. And, um, but email us. Tell us your favorite war movie. Uh, tell us why in a paragraph it's your favorite war movie. And then we will invite uh, a selection of the people who respond to come on the show on January 3rd. What a moment. What and a talk moment. About it. Yes, it is your chance to be you know, in the footsteps of Saul David, to be a guest on <laughs> History Happy Hour and, and talk about your favorite uh, war movie. And we even, Chris, it's even better. Do you know Is why? How, how could it be? I don't know. It why. could be better because the people who 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 do well enough to get on the show, they will get a swag bag of Stephen Ambrose goodies. Okay, go. I mean it is. It what is, could be better? It is like heaven. Okay, so <laughs> um, uh, and so we ask you to email us by Wednesday, December twenty third, which is my sister's birthday, uh, and that has nothing to do with that being our deadline. But email us by Wednesday, December twenty third. We'll post it up on Facebook again. Hhh at stephenambrosetours dot com. I'm just curious. Is he still here? He's still. I think so. He's still here. He's wow. He's still here. He's just <laughs> waiting for us. Is he here all the time? He can't um, wait. Yeah. They, so what is what what is what is your favorite? I want to know what is your favorite war movie and why? You can give people maybe somebody can copy your comments and and get on the show that way. Oh, uh, it's it's tricky because there there are there are definitely a couple in the running and uh, you know I, my one of my earliest books was about the Earl of Cardigan. The, the homicidal Earl was the name of the book, and it was about the guy who led the charge of the Light Brigade. So, you know, there's the, the two wonderful films about the charge of the Light Brigade, by the way, not not just one, but the Trevor Howard one in 1968 is an absolute classic. And when I was writing the book about the Earl of Cardigan, I was thinking of Trevor Howard. That's who you know, he was in my mind. He become for me the Earl of Cardigan. It was, you know, um, and he did look very like him actually. But no, I have to I have to plump for my first choice, which is Zulu. I mean, um, not only is it one of the great war films, but it's also a subject I've written about, too. I call my book Zulu for the simple reason that I knew there would be a, a, a name association with the film. I wasn't trying to pretend it was the book of the film because it, it covers a much broader period than the film. But, you know, the, the film Zulu about the Battle of Rourke's Drift, one of the greatest last ditch stands, the Alamo, I suppose, would would be your equivalent in the U.S. I mean, it's it's a fabulous story. 
uh, but also they do it brilliantly in the film. It's it's the film that made the name of of, of uh, you know a lot of the actors who you know you've never heard of. Absolutely. It wasn't a, wasn't a star studded cast at all. They made it on a shoestring. Uh, they made it with a lot of guys. Actually, I did, I made a documentary there many years later. We used some of the same Zulus that appeared in the film because you know they had all the kit, and they, you know, and they were up for the job. But it was I mean I promise you it was made on an absolute shoestring. It was it was shot. I'll just give you a couple of tiny quick factoids about the film because not many people know this one uh the, the 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 key figure in the story or one of the key figures in the story um one of the guys who who fights in the hospital and you know he's the ne'er do well and you know he's re- a guy Hook. called Hook, henry yeah. Hook in real life um Hook, Hook was perceived to be a ne'er do well in the film and of course they wanted to turn him into sort of cockney he actually came from gloucestershire which is quite close to where i was brought up in the west country um, he was a teetotaler. He wasn't a drinker at all. So they made that up for the film. And the and the family were so irritated when they when they went to see the premiere. They were all invited to the premiere uh, many years later, 90, 1963, I think it was, or 64, that they walked out of the film. But that aside, that liberty aside, it was an uh, it's a brilliant film made on a shoestring. Uh, stands the test of time uh, and it really inspired me to become a military historian so it has well, to be go. Zulu everybody well, see, go watch I, Zulu this week and and Salah's given you a great example of what we're going to be looking for on that January 3rd show so so well thank you again and now you can thanks, really so. leave this time but thanks for, for hanging around for that and what a great show cheers, cheers stay well guys. thanks, thanks so Chris I think we've ended we've come to the end sadly of another history happy hour I know but yeah. we have we have one coming up next week. So you... We do. We have Kate Warren, American Uprising in Second World War England, and then a week off, and then more movies. We'll be with you. Stay safe, everyone. 